you a wonderful friend that I've met on this journey, um, Ben Grosskup. <laughs> It is such an honor to be here at this campaign stop for Jill Stein. <laughs> the next people after me who are going to be speaking are from a group called Burners for Jill. <laughs> I want to know out there how many people in this room were excited by the candidacy of Bernie Sanders. <laughs> I think that we are in a political realignment right now, and this is our moment. <laughs> a campaign is a burning thing, and it makes a fiery ring. I stepped in and joined the choir. I fell into a ring of fire. Months of the Bernie Sanders campaign in July, I pledge my loyalty to Jill. 
I believe Bernie when he said, if I ever tell you who to vote for, do not listen to me. <laughs> Reverse, psychology. Reverse psychology, everybody. We all took Psych 101, okay? So I came out from LA six weeks ago, and I went and protested the uh, DNC and the corrupt Democratic Party, and I did Dem Exit. East Coast not knowing anybody except through social media and I've been blessed to make my Bernie and Jill family my true family. My friend Margaret Alexander and I are going across the eastern seaboard talking about Jill's message because I am supporting Jill and the Green Party because our country and our planet are in dire need of help. The future looks bleak if we continue our dependency on fossil fuels, the big banks, big pharma, big agriculture, and big sugar. These big, things, thank you. these big things need to be addressed now. We also need to protect our water supply. Yes. We need to ban fracking. Yes. We, need to ban we need to ban the pipelines. Yes. Only Dr. Stein and Ajamu Baraka stood by the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, and those are our brothers and sisters, and we need to protect them. the creation of sustainable infrastructure based on clean, renewable energy generation and sustainable community principles to stop what the party sees as a growing convergent of environmental crises in water, soil, fisheries, and forests. Her vision includes increasing intra-city mass transit and intercity railroads, creating complete streets that safely encourage bike and pedestrian traffic, and regional food systems based on sustainable organic agriculture. Brothers and sisters of every race, religion, creed, what kind of what kind of world do we want? It is time right now to make history. History starts right now. We have 50 odd days. Can we do it? Yes, we can. Can we do it? Can we do it? Can we for I encourage and I challenge each and every one of you. Talk to five people a day. Five people, five people, five people. It exponentially can explode. We have the power, it is in our hands. Well, my name is Margaret. I'm from a little town on the North Shore. Um, at 36 years old, I'm one of those young people that Bernie Sanders brought into the political process. And it's really just been since April of this year that I decided I need to get up out of my chair and do more than Facebook activity. <laughs> my activism for Bernie got me engaged with people throughout my home state. It also took me to New York City, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia. I canvassed, knocked on doors, and called people all across the country, including in Guam, I called people. Though I was disappointed when the Democrats did not nominate Bernie Sanders in outraged by the nomination process. I am grateful to Bernie for opening my eyes and galvanizing this movement that we're all part of. And I'm also so grateful to Jill Stein for carrying that torch forward. expands on Bernie's policies and issues, and is even more progressive, calling for a Green New Deal to address the emergency of climate change. It truly gives me hope that Jill recognizes the urgency of this crisis and articulates a clear vision for action. We need to save our planet, and we need to do it right now. Jill had me really hooked when I learned that she calls for canceling student debt as a top priority. It would indeed feel liberating to me 
to have a fresh start. And I believe Jill's not exaggerating the impact that freeing a generation of young people, and not so young people, from educational debt, so that we can pursue our passions and do the true work that needs to be done. I like that Jill Stein is a medical doctor who trained and taught at Harvard University. prioritizes clean air, food, and water, not just for her own family, but our entire nation and our friends. We all know our country has serious work to do to clean up our government so we can accomplish urgent goals. We can have health care as a right in this country. We can support our students. We can prioritize our tax dollars away from interventionist wars of opportunity and toward the fundamental challenges we face as a nation. The two -party, it's clear the two-party system isn't working for us, the people. We need more choices, we need more voices, and more candidates who stand up for our values. Jill stands for people, planet, and peace over profits. and to help bring the energy of Bernie's political revolution to Jill Stein's presidential campaign. Thank you. ladies that I am going to introduce, um, we came to know about them in April when a student group called UMass Divest decided to occupy the administrative building of UMass, the Whitmore building. And I believe 15 arrests came out of that. And they made history. And they are an example. They embody what young spirits and what people should be doing in the United States of America. student power climate justice organizations. We are working to get our schools and institutions to take their money out of the fossil fuel industry, which is one of the primary drivers of climate change, resulting in millions of deaths every year. Our campaign began in 2012 with just a few students who were concerned about the inaction of big institutions surrounding issues related to social justice and climate change. Students met with administration to express their concerns, but were met with count countless institutional barriers and no real action. We realized we needed to harness the power of the students in order to make real change. Over the past few years, we've done just this, through rallies, teach-ins about climate justice, <coughs> petitions and events, we have been able to engage and activate the broader campus community. All of our efforts culminated in a week-long sit-in last April. We began the sit-in on a Monday with just 20 people. And by Wednesday, there were over 250 students, faculty, alumni, and community members occupying the Whitmore Administration building. Following the week of action that resulted in 34 student arrests, the president of the UMass system, Marty Meehan, came to campus to tell the organizers that after seeing the community support for divestment, he wanted UMass to become the first major public university to divest from fossil fuels. both the Board of Trustees and the UMass Foundation voted for full divestment. This sit-in was part 
of a national week of action for divestment campaigns. The reverberations were felt across the country as one by one universities decided to partially or fully divest, including the University of Hawaii and Yale, to name a few. As the movement grows and more institutions divest, not only does the dirty fossil fuel industry lose economic support, but it loses the political and social license to destroy entire communities and ecosystems in their greedy pursuit for money. And even though we've won fossil fuel divestment, our fight is far from over. We live within a system which values profit and exponential growth over people's lives and treats entire communities as collateral damage in the endless quest for capital. Right now, the North Dakota Access Pipeline is threatening the livelihoods of indigenous communities, the same communities who have been disenfranchised at the hands of the state over and over again. This pipeline is projected to go through sacred lands and destroy the drinking water and ecological systems which these communities rely upon just to survive. Climate justice is a fight for social justice, a fight for people to have access to resources and to live in a healthy and safe environment. Divestment, divestment is just a tactic that is part of a growing movement to shift to a just and equitable economy, an economy that protects and empowers the people, especially those who have been systematically marginalized. Jill Stein shares our common goal of environmental justice. She doesn't just talk the talk as many politicians do, but she shows up time and time again. She came to our school last spring to show her support for divestment, and last week she made headlines by joining the Standing Rock in the fight for justice. energy and sustainable solutions, but most importantly, she is committed to investing back into communities and making sure the government is being held accountable. We are so excited to join together in this movement to make this vision of a future free of exploitation and climate injustice a reality. Thank you.
by the media and feared by elites. The Green Party is rising from the movements of the streets. We're learning of a different choice to leave the United States with no help from the Commission on Presidential
Massachusetts. Thank you to Rich Purcell. Where are you, Rich? And another thing I have to say about Rich is that he actually recruited the amazing Darlene Elias into the Green Party. So thank you to Darlene for taking that fight into the run for office. Was it City Council yes. in Holyoke? A fabulous campaign, did really well for her first run, and I'm expecting us to get her elected on the next election. Also, Joyce Palmer Fortune, and Nat Fortune, are you in the house here somewhere? Thank you, Nat and Joyce. Speaking of elected officials who've been leading the way in your little town of... Waitley. Waitley, where Joyce served on the... Selectman. Selectman for several years running, and just did a great job, Nat, on the school committee, and really set an example for us all of, you know, how it's, it's great to be out there, doing the social movements, which are really the engine of social change. And I know, looking around this room, that that is, that is our bread and butter. That's what we do. But we must also challenge power in the halls of power and take power in those halls of power. And Nat and Joyce showed how it can be done. So. So we're in this moment right now, you know, this incredible moment of historic crisis together with absolutely unprecedented transformational change. And it's kind of this little tug of war going on right now, which one is it gonna be? And we sort of see this all coming together in many ways at Standing Rock, at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, where there is this kind of converging crisis a crisis of human rights as these so-called construction machines, which are really destruction machines, are bulldozing the sacred sites and the historic burial grounds of the Standing Rock Sioux. So you've got this human rights absolute emergency going on. At the same time, we have an attack on our water, the water of the Standing Rock Sioux Nation, but also the water for 17 million people downstream on the Missouri River at a time when we have historic drought uh, here in the Northeast, uh, down in the Southwest, yeah, historic fires going on uh, on the West Coast of the country. And you know, there they are putting our water supply at incredible risk with this very toxic fossil fuels, this back and fuel that will cross the rivers many times over, but in, in particular will cross under uh, the Missouri River. And then you also have this attack on the climate. We cannot afford not this, not this pipeline, not the Dakota Access Pipeline. We cannot afford one more pipeline. in Massachusetts stopping the Northeast Direct Pipeline as well. Thank you so much. Please raise your hand if you are part of that battle. And we want to thank you so much. Yes, let's give another round of applause. And it's not only the climate and water supply and our human rights, it's also our basic democracy is under attack when peaceful protesters are having the attack dogs loosed on them and pepper spray in their faces simply for standing up uh, with our First Amendment rights to protest uh, for redress of grievances. Amy Goodman, for goodness sake, who's on who should be under arrest for not being there and not doing their job. And I'm going to say, you know, I have an arrest warrant out for me. But they, they issued the warrant for the wrong person. I wasn't committing the vandalism there. Thank you.
Nations Standing Committee on Indigenous Rights came out and said that this was really outrageous, that that, um, that permit never should have been given to the Dakota Access Pipeline Company without actually the informed consent of the indigenous people, which they didn't have because that pipeline was supposed to run through the, um, through the major city there. What is it, Bismarck? It was supposed to run through the major city and when they complained about putting their water supply at risk, it was moved rather quickly. So it's no surprise the indigenous nations were not consulted. But, you know, this is really what the future looks like. And when I saw what had happened, what had gone on, and the desecration of that land, and the incredible courage of the Native American leaders who were proceeding with the lockdown. The morning after I got there, there was word went out through the encampment that we were all coming out for an action. So everybody went down to the site, and sure enough, several of these construction, actually destruction machines had been taken over and they were locked down, the indigenous leaders were locked down. Actually, I'm ashamed to admit, I was invited at that point to do a lockdown. And I hadn't gone there intending to do civil disobedience, to tell you the truth. So I declined that opportunity because it's a big deal, you know, to do a lockdown. You can get tased and beaten up and all kinds of things that I really wasn't quite prepared to undertake. But then when they came back to me and they said, well, would you join us? in writing a message here to the world on the blade of this piece of destruction equipment, there was no way I could in good conscience say no to that. Really 
here to see, it's here for all the world to see, that when we really stand up for what is right, we prevail, and they succeeded, as you heard, in actually achieving the divestment of the university from fossil fuels, which is really an incredible right now, standing up for living wages, standing up for LGBTQ rights. Standing up to ensure that every black life matters. These are not just like 
great ideas. We're not just the movement with great ideas. These happen to be basic American values and community values, by the way. two groups here. One is the Bernie Sanders campaign, those who have gone green in the Dem exit and the burning green burners. If you were part of the Bernie movement, just raise your hand so we can thank you. Thank you so much for standing up and for refusing to be silent. And I want to thank also those who've been working hard building the Green Party so that we could be here and great ideas, these are also, these are, th th this, these are the populist things. This is really where America stands. And I learned that myself when I fought my way into a debate. We fought our way into a governor's debate in 2002. You know, we were told that we were the lunatic fringe. But when I emerged from that TV studio, having said pretty much what we're saying here today, it was the 2002 version, but it was not much different from what we're talking about now. When I emerged from that debate where these ideas went over like a lead balloon in front of the moderator and the other candidates, it was like, whoa, what planet are you guys living on? But when we walked out to where the press was waiting, I was mobbed by the press who told me that I had won the debate on the instant online viewer poll. And that, you know, that was like, that was my wake up moment. Until then, you know, I was, I was like doing due diligence. I was doing what I felt obliged to do as a, as a member of the human community. You know, I was fighting that fight, but I really, I was drinking the Kool-Aid and thinking that we were, you know, we were just like out there on the margins. But at that moment, when I heard that we had won the debate, you know, not even doing a particularly good job, you know, that, that people are just ready, you know, and, and, and we're like wound up like a spring looking for a politics of integrity. And that was 2002, and it's only more so now. So, you know, the, the, the take home message there is that we really do represent the heart and soul of the American community, which is basically not just American values, these are human values that we all represent. And I want to suggest a new meaning to the word American exceptionalism. What's really exceptional about America to be proud of is that people have come here as immigrants, joining the Native Americans who were here to start with, joining the African Americans who had no choice, who were dragged over here, but we've come from all four corners of the world. And so we've been engaged in this dialogue here to kind of find our common humanity. That's kind of our challenge here in America. And as we distill out of this great conversation, we distill out of this how we are one human family. That is American exceptionalism. <laughs> Let me say a quick word about our power, because our power is not only that we hold the moral high ground here, our power is not only that it's practical, our plans are the only blueprint for going forward. Otherwise, we don't have a climate to live in. We don't have an economy. We call for breaking up the big banks and establishing public banks and community banks. I mean, we really have this, we've called together the solutions that you are leading the way on, that you have been implementing. We put them together, so we got the solutions. But it turns out we also have the numbers. And I just want to assure you, of what a potential tipping point we are at right now. 
If we have the courage of our convictions and we stand up, and here's one way that we have this power, if you look at the number of people who are trapped in student loan debt, anybody know anybody out there stuck in student loan? Yeah, I think there are a few people out there. Well, it turns out there are enough people out there in student loan debt. It's not only millennials, it's also people moving well into middle age and into retirement, because you don't get out of these these loans, the way they're structured, they cannot be repaid, especially in today's economy. So it turns out these 43 million people, guess what? That happens to be a winning plurality of the presidential race in the three-way vote. So we actually have the power. If word gets out that friends don't let friends stay home debt that we come out and vote green in 2016, millennials can actually take over this election and win it so that we bail out the students like we bailed out the friggin' bankers who crashed the economy. If we came up with $16 trillion to bail out the guys who crashed the economy on Wall Street, we can come up with the $1.3 trillion to bail out the victims. not contribute its share. If you put a tiny tax on Wall Street transactions, it's what the National Nurses United calls a Robin Hood tax, because uh, it does the right thing and it moves that cash flow in the right direction. A tiny tax of half of a percent would actually raise hundreds of billions of dollars a year, way more than what is needed actually to make public higher education free, which is what we call for, and have more left over to pay off that student debt. And there are many other ways it can come from as well. Like for example, we call for cutting the military budget in half. After 54%, it drops way down to 7%. Our budget is mostly a military budget with a bunch of little footnotes around it, like for housing and government services, etc. Healthcare, Medicare, and so on are paid through specific um, uh, fees, you could say, or you know, through the payroll tax, and so it's a dedicated uh, insurance fund. But in terms of our taxes and the general fund, 54% is going into the friggin' military. So that's like half, almost half of your income taxes. The $6 trillion is what it cost for Iraq and Afghanistan wars alone. You know how much $6 trillion cost you? Every household in America, on average, is putting in $50,000 for the catastrophes of Iraq and Afghanistan. Can you think of a few other things you would rather do with your $50,000 than just create more crisis and terror around the world? So they can only get away with this while it is hidden from view. That's why it's so critical for us to be in the presidential debates. just one minute as, as we close here, because I want to leave some time for questions. But about this war thing, you know, what we've created with that six trillion dollars and more, actually, because that was just Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, what we've created, you know, it's like not working on steroids, it's not working. We've created failed states, mass refugee migrations, which are tearing apart Europe and the Middle East, and we've created worse terrorist threats. 
Let's be clear about this. It's not working. It's not getting better. It just creates new and more devastating forms of terrorism, desperation that we create out of these quagmires. So ISIS was created out of the catastrophe of Iraq and Libya, and Al-Qaeda was created you know, where was Al-Qaeda created? Well, in part, Al-Qaeda grew out of Afghanistan where the CIA and Saudi Arabia, in all their wisdom, created this new international jihadi movement as a way to disrupt the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. So wasn't that a great idea? You know, they trained the likes of Osama bin Laden. That's how he actually got his training in this new global jihadi movement that we were creating in order to thwart the, uh, the, the Soviet Union. So this has like been a really bad plan that has come back to bite us with a, you know, just infinite uh, vengeance here. So it's time for a new kind of offensive in the Middle East. We call it a peace offensive in the Middle East. like her, they just really, really don't like Donald Trump. And poor Donald Trump 
It's even more extreme. It's not just one third, it's like one quarter of his supporters that are really behind him. Three quarters of his supporters are mainly just really, really afraid of Hillary Clinton. So what's wrong with this picture? Democracy is not who do we hate the most or who are we most afraid of? Where does that get us? Democracy needs a moral compass. It needs our vision and our values. Democracy And if we vote for the lesser evil, you know, the, the mythology is that, oh, just hold your nose, vote for the lesser evil, and things will get better. But, excuse me, have things been getting better? No! No! How's it working out for you? You know, a lot of debt, our jobs went overseas, you know, and all the reasons we were told to vote for the lesser evil you know, to support this politics of fear. Because you didn't want our jobs going overseas, you didn't want our wages going down, you didn't want the attack on workers and immigrants, and you didn't want um, this, uh, this massive prison state and mass incarceration, you didn't want growing student debt, you didn't want the meltdown of the climate and the endless expanding wars. That's exactly what we've gotten by allowing ourselves to be silenced and to allow a lesser evil politician speak for us. Because they are not for us. They are actually, you know, bought and paid for by their corporate sponsors. If you didn't know it from just looking around in everyday life, you know, look at the studies, this study out of Princeton and Northwestern a couple of years ago, Gillens and Page, it showed that there was virtually a zero relationship between what the public wanted, actual public opinion, and the policies that get passed in Washington, D.C. They are all about serving their corporate masters, the predatory banks, the fossil fuel giants, the war profiteers, and the health insurance industry. That is not what we need. We are the ones we've been waiting for. that they can come out and cancel their debt, we would turn this election on its head. We would have a voter revolt right now in real time. So there is a magic wand, in fact, and I wouldn't doubt that for the minute. But it's not like, you know, these lesser evilists say that, that uh, oh, it's, things are gonna be great if we just vote for Hillary and defeat Donald Trump. Well, where does Donald Trump come from? He's part of a movement of right-wing extremism, which is a response to the economic misery that's been generated by Democrats as well as by Republicans. You know, it's not just any old Democrat, but in particular it was Bill Clinton with the support of Hillary that passed two of the major bills creating this economic misery. That is Wall Street deregulation that paved the way to the Wall Street meltdown and the disappearance of nine million jobs, the theft of five million homes, and it was also NAFTA, which Bill Clinton supported, uh, with Hillary's support as well, and now the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and though Hillary says she's changed her mind, you know, well, we've seen that before, and, you know, who did she appoint as her transition director? Ken Salazar, who's a big booster for the TPP. So, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me a thousand times, shame on us. We say it's time to stand up for the future that we need and not be intimidated. It is possible for us to win this on a dime. You know, it is numerically possible. As Woody Allen says, 
half of life is showing up. You want to be there as the house of cards falls down. And that house of cards is falling down, and it just could fall down before the November election. So I wouldn't rule out the potential for us actually to go all the way in this election. <laughs>
discussed or debated. We will not hear a real challenge to this insane, catastrophic war policy that's just creating failed states. We will not hear about nuclear disarmament and about how the Russians actually propose that we, we and the Russians together, draw down on our arsenals to 1,000 weapons, uh, and then we bring all the nations together to completely ban and dismantle the nuclear weapons for once and for all. So, we are the ones we've been waiting for. In the words of Alice Walker, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. We have it. We're going to use it. We have the power to create an America and a world that works for all of us, that puts people, planet, and peace over profit. The power to create that world is not just in our hopes. It's not just in our dreams. Right here, right now, in Western Massachusetts, that power is in our hands. Thank you. to act 
actually define those jobs and create them with small businesses, with worker cooperatives, with nonprofits, and with uh, government as an employer of last resort where we need those jobs in order to meet the goals of the Green New Deal, which are essentially to become sustainable. Thank you. I'm a teacher in Springfield. I met you at a rally down there a couple months ago. Um, thank you for being our voice. I'm sure this is exhausting. Um, my question is for the progressives that are voting for Hillary. I know vote for the greater good, that sounds great, but around here we have a lot of college professors and such that need facts and details. Is there anything that you would recommend saying to people, especially about what happened with Ralph Nader, to get through to some of the people? So, great, great question. So, two quick thoughts. One is that we're in a very different time than we were back in 2000. Because right now, we actually have the majority of the American people who are saying they don't like or trust these candidates and they want someone else. So this is about standing up with the courage of our convictions because this time we actually have the numbers that we can turn this around. But let me also say that um, it helps when you're talking to professor types to actually point out the track record here. So let's not just repeat the mantra, let's look at where we've gotten with the lesser evil. So if you look at uh, the Obama administration when they had two houses of Democratic Congress, so they couldn't blame it on the Republicans, what did we get? We got massive bailouts for Wall Street, just ginormous. When the public was screaming not to do it, they went ahead and did, you know, and, and where have we gotten with that? You know, absolutely nowhere. The banks are too big to fail, still bigger than ever, in fact, and the economy still teeters on the brink. The recovery is a false recovery of lousy part-time temporary jobs. So, you know, on the economy, the Democrats, when they had the power, they didn't do it. Um, likewise on the climate, that all of the above, Obama's policy and the Democrats, was actually far worse for the climate than drill baby drill because it totally blew the lid off of fossil fuel production. Nature, unfortunately, doesn't care about renewable energy. Nature cares about carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases. And under the Democrats, that's gone through the roof, even when they were signing the climate accords in Paris, writing those accords. What was Obama doing? He was signing the repeal of the oil export ban. So it makes it look like we're doing the right thing because they don't count those emissions, but extraction in this country has gone through the roof. Hillary Clinton established an office for fracking. Yeah, Donald Trump is for coal, and that's a disaster, but actually less of a disaster because that's not economically viable anymore. It is shutting itself down. Hillary Clinton is for, is for fracking, and that's a real disaster, which actually is going to do us in. So, there are differences between the parties, but they're not different enough to save your job. Who is it that's leading the charge on the Trans-Pacific Partnership? It's the Democrats. Not enough to save your job, not enough to save your life. Look at where we've gotten with Obamacare. One out of three Americans now cannot afford health care, even when they have health insurance under Obamacare. And it, they're not different enough to save the planet because of what they are doing. So I would say, hey, you're a professor. You're supposed to care about the facts. Let's look at the facts. They're not working. I am a former Bernie supporter. And I am more than happy to have you leading us now for uh, stage two of our movement. Um, I'm also a former Republican and a CEO of a company here locally. And I'm very interested to know what is your position on the federal minimum wage and what plans do you have for um, holding Big Pharma accountable for, for what they're doing to our country? So we need the minimum wage to be a living wage. We owe this to working America. Had their wages kept pace with the increase in their productivity, their wages would be far higher, more like $20 an hour. So this is, uh, this is a, this is justice deferred, which needs to be restored on that basis alone. We need to make the minimum wage at least a $15 an hour living wage. And the president, the president actually has the authority to raise those wages right now 
for the workers who are part of federal contracting. And the studies suggest that this actually pays for itself. It's some hundreds of thousands of workers who could immediately have their wages raised. It pays for itself in improved worker retention and better productivity, which has been shown to take place when workers have decent wages. And that's true across the country. If we would raise the wage, it will be a huge stimulus package for the economy. And while it may be, um, you know, it may be a stretch for some of the smaller businesses, what history shows is that they get more business in exchange and that the net impact is to be a huge benefit for businesses and for the economy as a whole. It primes the pump from below. We need to get real dollars into the hands of working people. That's what generates the engine of our economy. Thank you. Big Pharma needs to be reined in. And, you know, unfortunately there was a deal cut with Big Pharma in creating the Affordable Care Act, that if they would go along with it, that they could get off scot-free and, you know, just uh, throw us under, under the bus in their extortion. The, the prices like the EpiPen, which costs $400, a life-saving medication, $400 for $1 worth of medicine packed into that EpiPen. This is absolutely outrageous. So what we need to do for pharma is what we also need to do for the war profiteers, what we need to do for the big banks, which is to get the money out of our political system to have publicly funded elections and to stop the revolving door. It's not that hard. so many of these appointments to these regulatory agencies in the first place, the president actually has the power to shut down the revolving door right then and there and not make those appointments. So that's where we would start. Um, I just wanted to ask a question in regards to Facebook. You posted a event a while back on the campaign school or something along the lines, and I was curious if you were going to potentially get involved in that again because I've been over your bus and I definitely need to be further educated on this one. This is something that we've been doing in the Green Party periodically. Um, I think that's where I first met Darlene. Um, it's a way to train up people so that you can run for office at the local level. And by the way, we've had about 3,000 Greens who've run for local office over the last decade or so, and fully 1,000 of them were actually elected. So we have scores of people who are in local office, and this is where we build that groundswell from below, and that's part of the purpose of running a headliner campaign, so that we can help engage people like you to be part of this, excuse me, this political takeover <clears throat> from below. Um, so stay tuned and um, watch for it. And I encourage you also to get in touch with your local Green Rainbow Party chapter to be a part of the campaign schools and just all the other movement building and power building that we are doing through the Green Rainbow Party. David Anderson, as the only presidential candidate with a doctorate sciences, I'm sure you appreciate the value of science to the human race. I was wondering if you could quickly outline for us, please, if you would, your vision for the future of space exploration at NASA. Great. Great. Wonderful. In my view, we need to take our dollars back from destroying other civilizations. And the minute we do that, we have a lot of money to invest in the things that we need. So that includes having, uh, for example, a medical research institution, which is not controlled by pharmaceutical companies, but which is actually nutrition, like for example, nutrition, you know? Nutrition is pretty darn important. Uh, we need to stop making people sick. You know, right now we don't put very much into researching that kind of stuff. We mostly research uh, things that we can put patents on and, and sell at uh, substantial prices in terms of the health industry. But in terms of space and exploration, there's been lots of spin-offs 
uh, lots of practical tools that have come out of space exploration. So yes, indeed, I do support uh, providing that budget for space exploration. We don't need it in the military. We can put it into science and doing the kinds of research, which is exciting and interesting and tells us about the nature of the universe and the nature of life, uh, as well as having practical applications uh, for us down here on planet Earth. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I help run a local support group for LGBTQ people, and I'm also from the South and have moved up here a few years ago. And the biggest thing that I have seen is lack of support for transgender folks, especially those of color. What is it that your administration will do with steps across the country in order to support those people? So we need to stand up for LGBTQ rights, and that particularly applies to transgenders, who endure so much uh, discrimination, hostility, and violence, including economic violence, discrimination at the workplace. So we need to ensure that people's jobs are protected and that uh, discrimination on the basis of uh, gender identity uh, is not allowed. Uh, we need to protect those jobs. We also need to ensure that uh, in schools, whether it's colleges or whether it's our primary and secondary schools, that we are respecting LGBTQ rights and training um, people in techniques to stop bullying and to intervene against bullying and not allow it. Um, you know, and we just need to be very clear that that kind of discrimination, whether it's based on race, whether it's based on gender, whether it's based on religion, or whether it's based on uh, sexual identity or gender identity, is just not acceptable. We need to support people for who their identity says that they are.